are rated by the New York Times as one of the most influential Americans in Israel. And we're talking about the highly booming high-tech business uh, in this country that is rumored at the moment to rival the Silicon Valley in the USA. And my question is, is this a new trend? Well, I'm not sure. Uh, Israel is the world's other Silicon Valley. Clearly, Silicon Valley is the most important location for innovation. It gave the world Facebook and Intel, Google, so much that we take for granted in, in our modern technology-driven lives. But when you look at where else in the world exciting new technologies are coming from, it really is Israel. And I'm very happy that we're number two. We don't have to be number one. We're number two to Silicon Valley, but we're far ahead of everybody else who competes with us. So you look at countries like the UK or Germany or Japan or Korea or India or China, in terms of innovation, creating new kinds of internet applications, new kinds of semiconductors, new kinds of clean technology, new kinds of medical technology, Israel really is number two in the world. It makes a lot of sense until you realize that we're a country of eight million people. What motivates uh, Israelis to, to, to do all this? Look, it's, you have to go back into Jewish history because Israel is the Jewish state. It's the, um, we have minorities who live here, but it reflects thousands of years of Jewish history. And you have to ask yourself more basic questions. Why are 30% of the Nobel Prizes, and you guys come from Norway, uh, in the sciences over the last hundred years been given to Jews? Why in the Forbes 400 list, or the rich list in the UK, or the similar lists in Australia, why are 20 or 25% of these people Jewish? Now, the enemies of the Jews think it's a conspiracy, think that Jews cheat. Now, you guys who are Norwegians know there's no way of cheating the Nobel Prize Committee. <laughs> look at those people look at who deserves, from a very, very objective way, the true you know, awards in the sciences. And other people say, okay, you know what? Maybe it's in your DNA. Maybe it's because you're smart, and maybe it's because you, you know, bred that way. And that's also not true. What, it, what it's about is that Jews over thousands of years have developed a culture of creativity, of hard work, of achievement, but most importantly, of risk-taking. Jews think out of the box. Jews step out of their comfort zone. We've always done so. And you can go back and look at the history of Abraham, who was our father, meant father of, actually the word Abraham means father of multiple nations, okay? And he a, was a great man. But what did he do? He was the first immigrant, right? In the beginning of the Bible, when we meet Abraham, the early books, he says, God says to Abraham, lech lecha, go for yourself. Get out of your country and be an immigrant. Now today we read this and we say, yeah, fine, he's an immigrant. We don't realize that back in those days, no one was an immigrant. To be an immigrant, to go to a foreign land was dangerous. People didn't welcome you at Ellis Island or give you a European pension or whatnot as an immigrant. You had to go really step out of your comfort zone. But God says to Abraham, don't just go, go for yourself. Because in this act of becoming an immigrant, of going somewhere, you're going to improve yourself, you're going to become a better person. And um, this is what Jews have always done. We've always taken that risk. If you look at our history, people have tried to kill us for quite some time. But there's an old Jewish joke about how do you define a Jewish holiday? They tried to kill us. They didn't succeed. Now let's eat. Okay. The idea being that despite this pressure, we go ahead and choose life. My people, the Jewish people, from the beginning, we've always been risk takers. We live with risk. What's the risk? Existential risk of being destroyed. That's real risk. The risk of starting a company, taking a little bit of uh, investor, investor money and God forbid losing it. Big deal. It doesn't compute. It's not a real risk. Real risk is Iran, not starting a company. So that attitude is what's driven Jewish scientists and Jewish composers and Jewish business people throughout the ages. And that's why we've been as successful and as creative as we have been. It's no surprise that the Jewish state is outperforming this way. 
it would be a surprise if it wasn't performing this way. So you would actually say then that to take the role of the victim is really something that you would not find a, a, a Jew doing so easily culturally. Look, we're sometimes victims, but I don't want to be a victim, right? In other words, we were victims in the Nazis, okay, where my people were destroyed and burned and, and, and killed. But the whole idea behind Israel is that we go from being an object of history to becoming a subject of history. It's too long that we've read our history as a series of they killed us, they expelled us, they hurt us. That means that we're an object, that people are making decisions for us. What the Zionist movement said and what led us back from all these countries to Israel is the notion that we're now subjects of history, that we can make our own history, that we can come back and reclaim. This is the only case in the history of the world where an indigenous people has come back to its land. Okay, we are the indigenous people here. I go scratch in the dirt and I find pieces of shards that have Hebrew that my grandchildren can read because the language is contiguous. We've lived in this country for thousands of years. We were expelled. We traveled around the world. Most people who were expelled from their nation forgot about it, assimilated. We didn't. We came home. But this coming home has released this incredible amount of creative energy, of uh, energy in the science area, in the business area, in the military area. We had to learn how to be fighters. Jews were not allowed to bear arms. Jews were not recruited for the armies. Okay, Jews couldn't even own land and be farmers. And so when we came home, you have these intellectuals who all of a sudden worshiped the land, said you were going to now make the land bloom, the desert bloom. They taught themselves to be farmers. They taught themselves to pick up guns so we could defend ourselves. So it's, it's, in my opinion, it's absolutely one of the great stories of the modern time of a people that had been so oppressed and so persecuted coming home. It turns out that one of the things that's going on now in the economic front is that the trade between Israel and the Arab nations has never been so high. If you get on a plane, it'd be great to go take a camera and just go from Ben Gurion Airport to Amman and then on into the Arab world. You'll see them filled with business people because Israel is selling like crazy and the Arabs are buying like crazy parts of Israel with technology. If we realize that we can live together and thrive together and not kill each other, it's fine. What people don't understand is that there are issues in this region that are far beyond Israel. The issues in this region are that there are people who want to move the world back to the Middle Ages, who think that you know a, a, a society and a culture where you chop hands off or you chop heads off, where you you know discriminate against women and homosexuals, that that is the society that we should create. And then there are others who believe that the this, we're, you know we've got to get with the program, be part of the modern world. That's an issue which is far greater and far more important than the Arab-Israeli conflict. The Arab-Israeli conflict with all due respect, is really a sideshow. In the meantime, we're surviving, we're flourishing, we're growing this country, we can defend ourselves, thank God. And this is, uh, I think, going to end up ultimately with some kind of peace, I hope. Uh, but in the meantime, you know, we have to uh, be careful and defend ourselves. It's so interesting to see how Facebook, Google, so many of these companies have so many Israeli products within their uh, sphere. And thinking about the fact that cell phones, instant messages, all this comes from Israel. How come we hear so little about uh, the Israeli origin? So Israeli companies don't promote the fact that they're Israeli companies. It doesn't really get them anything. Uh, on the other hand, the stuff starts here. So if you ask executives at Intel and executives at Facebook or executives at IBM or uh, Cisco, or they'll all tell you, of course, Israel is critical. What role does the IDF and the educational system play in spotting new talent and helping people to excel? A huge role. The, the, you cannot overestimate the role of the IDF and the universities in this country. Would you like to have an army? Do you want to send your kids to army? No, no one wants to do that. Okay, I'd much rather live in, uh, you know, Luxembourg, where the, where the worst thing you have to worry about is taxes. Okay, um, but here we have an army, and our kids put their lives on the line. They work very hard. They spend years of their lives. I mean, the officers spend start with five years, and yet this has turned out to be a huge blessing, that the kids who come through this process 
end up getting life experiences when they add then the university to this, that they're ready to become entrepreneurs. You have said that uh, kids are not cuddled in Israel. <laughs> and we come from a culture, both in the US and, and in Europe today, where kids are very much cuddled. Uh, do you think that creates a different attitude and how? Yeah, I, I think there's an interesting uh, dynamic here in terms of child rearing and focus on children. First of all, Israel is a very child-centric society. Part of that is historical because we lost so many children in the Holocaust. A million and a half children were killed. And um, today, every child is precious. You know, people look at it and say, this was, we name our children after, you know, uh, people who died in the past. And there's a, a, a palpable sense of this is our future. So number one, we have lots of kids. Israel is the fastest growing you know, child producing country in the Western world today. Our average birth rate is three per woman, okay, which is, you look at Europe today and if you've got one and a half or one, that's a lot, okay. But here in Israel, it's three. So we're producing kids like crazy. But you, you just sense it because you go around the society and you see the, kin the kindergartens are full, and the playgrounds are full, and the sizes of the families are, are significant. There are four kids, five kids, six kids. And I would go with my, uh, my family and friends of ours, we'd go visit Europe often in the summer, summer vacation, go to Switzerland, go to Greece. And sometimes when we were two families or three families, each with their four or five kids, people would stop us on the street and say, oh, is this a day camp? How do I get my kids into your day camp? They couldn't understand that we actually have families that are this size. So there's this whole family attitude where it's really central, uh, you know, very much, kid-centric. On top of that, because we're such a small country, it's very intergenerational. People don't understand that in Israel, I'm a grandparent, I have four grandchildren. Um, I see my grandchildren every week. And if I don't see them every week, my son's getting a call where I'm yelling at him saying, you're a bad son, bring me my grandkids. And it's not just me, it's every Israeli family, because the kids bring the grandkids to the parents. So you've got this it's almost like an old, you know, sort of archaic view of things, but an intergenerational family. I know that in America, where I grew up, it's not so much that way, because the kids live in California and the parents live in New York, and so you get a chance to see each other once a year on Christmas or Thanksgiving or whatever. Here, it's every week. You're seeing that intergenerational family. There's a rumor that you are an historian and that's how you started out your life and that you first came to Israel as a tour guide, but then somebody apparently told you to spend your life on something more worthwhile. <laughs> Is this true? It's, it's very true. Um, you've done your, your homework. <laughs> I appreciate this. Um, look, I, I studied history at the University of California at Berkeley and I love history and I've always been fascinated by it. And I came here and I started acting as a tour guide, which I thought was a, a fun career. And I was young and it, and it paid the bills. And I met lots of you know, nice girls and it was, it was great. Um, but my father showed up and my father was a physicist and he wanted to go meet some of the researchers at one of the scientific institutes for the military. And he said, would, would you come with me and drive me to this meeting? So I went with him up to visit these guys. And, this is the day before the iPhone, I had nothing to do, so I sat there in this meeting. I understood nothing they were talking about. My father had a little startup engaged in fiber optic communications. And finally, at the end of the meeting, the guys who were the researchers turned to me and said, okay, young Medved, and, and they were speaking Hebrew, so my father wouldn't understand, saying, well, what do you do? And I said, I'm a tour guide, and I'm you know, lecturing to college groups and kibbutz groups. And the guy looked at me and said, what a waste. I said, what do you mean, what a waste? This is, I'm, I'm living in Israel, fulfilling a Jewish dream of thousands of years. He said, no, no, no. What Israel needs now is not more historians and not more tour guides. We need more fiber optics. What your dad is doing, go help your dad, go build a factory. And so on the way home from uh, this meeting, I asked my father, what do you do? And I ended up uh, becoming his partner in this fiber optic communication system. And this was my first experience in business. You are a multi-million dollar guy. You have all the money around you that you want. You could have been sitting on a yacht 
enjoying life and not engaging in all this kind of work. What motivates you to keep giving interviews like this and what motivates you in life to help people in the startup businesses and all this the way you do? I have the best job in the world. My job is to help people make their dreams come true. I think that most people do live very productive and good lives. I think that what's happened, unfortunately, is the media, because of the, the narrative and the storytelling, we always look for the, the tragedy, for the, the thriller, for the crime, for the, you know, the, uh, the outliers, that, that, because that, you know, frankly, makes interesting movies or, or novels. But people lose perspective that that is the exception, that the rule among most societies is that people are good, people are law-abiding, people are ethical, people are moral. I don't believe people are evil. I believe people are, are decent, okay? And they want to make a living and they want to support their family and they want to love and they want to have fun. Okay, that's what most people want. Now, there are unfortunately many problems in the world. There's a lot of poverty, there's a lot of sickness, there is injustice, okay? But it's, you know, you can't just ignore this. You have to deal with it. Our attitude in the Jewish people has always been that when God created the world in six days, it wasn't perfect. The world is not made perfect. The world was made in order to be fixed by man. That, that man is supposed to be a partner with God in the creative process. That our job is to try to finish the work. And by the way, you can never finish it, okay? When the Messiah comes, maybe, okay? But in the meantime, it takes effort and it's your job as an individual to get out there and to do something. And whether that something is to write a poem or whether it's to you know, be a farmer or it's to be a tech person or to be a soldier or to be a businessman, this is all good. Many people completely misunderstand business. They think that business is evil, that somehow to be a businessman means to be a cheater and a liar and someone who's preying on other people. And they don't understand that to be a business person is first and foremost to create jobs. And, and uh, there was a great philosopher in, in Jewish history called Maimonides, the Rambam, who wrote in the 11th century. And he wrote a book about charity, uh, about what are the various kinds of charity and how important are they. And he said, for example, that when you give money to a poor person directly in their face, that's very good, but it's much worse than giving to them in secret. You know, giving someone anonymously is a better and higher form of charity. But he said the most high form of charity is not to give somebody money, but is to give them a job. So, so many of the companies that we're doing are focused on improving people's lives in terms of health, in terms of agriculture, in terms of just making you know, the world a better place. That it's just an incredibly warm and good feeling to be able to help these kind of people realize their dreams. So how would you define a successful life? Hmm. For me, and this is only what I can say for myself, I like first and foremost to be part of a family, okay, a loving family. And today everybody has different families and there are sometimes one parent or three parents or, you know, and that's all fine, but to have a family unit, I find is really, you know, centering and wonderful and, and it gives me a sense of, of immortality. Ultimately, it's about being part of the world. It's about somehow looking at your fellow person and seeing the beauty, seeing the spark of godliness in everybody. I mean, I think it's about building a mutual tolerance among people and among nations, among communities, where we realize that we're not all alike. We're not going to all think alike and talk alike and be alike. And that's good. That's what makes the world exciting. The problem is, is to be respectful of different traditions, to realize that people think and are different. And if that kind of tolerance grows, there'll be peace between Arabs and Jews. I mean, we're just arguing over territory. That's ridiculous. Okay. To, to really sit down and say, you know what, this can be done. We can build a deal going forward. And I think that, you know, we're here, we're not going anywhere. You know, to think, you know, if, if some of them think that we're going to give up and die, they're wrong. Our country is thriving. We're one of the fastest growing countries in the world. 
We've got a dynamic economy. We're inventing incredible things. We're strong and we can defend ourselves. So the quicker they get over it and say, you know what, let's make a deal. Let's figure out how to live with the Jews. Let's create a better world together. Then not only will this create peace between Arabs and Jews, but it'll really help the rest of the world go forward. What advice would you give to the young people of today as they're growing up in, in quite a rough world? First of all, you know, it seems rough. It's a lot less rough than it was 50 or 100 or 200 years ago. Have a dream, okay? The one thing you, you should, if you don't have a dream, then you're missing it. And that dream can be in any area. It can be to be a great sports person or a great singer or to, you know, uh, work for a company or to help people with charity or to, you know, simply be, you know, a, a good teacher or a good social worker. All of that is wonderful. Be a good mom, be a good dad, be a good brother, be a good son. These are wonderful dreams to have. Okay. But to have a dream, that's the most important thing you need. There's so much in the world to explore, whether it's to hike or to, to fish or to sail or to, uh, ex you know, create or to study or to read a book. And I think that that all starts with, with obviously parents and communities and having, uh, uh, a sense of grounding. Um, one of the things we're very lucky with here in Israel is that we know where we came from. In other words, in order to be able to plan the future, you need to know your past.